recording has started. Everyone, I'd like to introduce you to our Bay Care Presents series, Dr. Moulton, and oh, my aching back. Hello, good day, guys. Um, thanks for your attention today. My name is Andrew Moulton. Um, <clears throat> I am an orthopedic surgeon who is specialized in spine surgery. Um, what that means is uh, did orthopedic training and did what we call a fellowship in spine surgery. I did actually two fellowships. The second was uh, a sort of prestigious traveling fellowship. And then I served as a um, professor at New York Medical College training spine surgeons and uh, orthopedic surgeons how to do spine surgery. So I've trained uh, dozens of neurosurgeons and spine surgeons from all over the world at the Hospital for Special Surgery for some time and wrote books. So I was very sort of academic uh, background. Um, I'm here in lovely uh, Tampa Bay area now with uh, private practice, um, trying to do it the best way I think possible with a lot of attention to my patients. And um, I think that kind of carries over from my time uh, spent for many years training uh, surgeons. I, I enjoy um, trying to teach people, you know, what's going on, have people become components of their own kind of plan for getting better. And so um, I like to be uh, comprehensive in the approach to, you know, treating problems and uh, involving every, every aspect of, you know, treatment that helps you get better from back pain. Because as, although I'm a surgeon, obviously surgery is typically not what you need to do to get better from back pain. So let's get to this PowerPoint presentation. Um, this is my organization, All Spine Care, and um, I work primarily at Bay Care Hospital. Um, I've been here for several years in the Tampa Bay area. Um, this presentation is basically designed to help you get a little bit of a sense of what's behind the curtain with respect to when you go to a doctor with back pain, um, what are they actually thinking and, and looking for? Um, and how do, what, what goes through their mind as far as the thought process and helping you find a path forward? So um, let's see. Again, I was basically teaching for many years as chief of a trauma center, um, had written books and a very academic background, but in private practice now. Um, so these are the topics we're gonna go through going to go through a little bit of anatomy just to kind of get you a sense of what what it means lumbar spine these kinds of terminology and things um, in addition and actually closer towards the end we're going to take a look at a couple of x-rays and mris and cat scans just so you have a sense of what it is that those things mean because they give us different pieces of information um, we're going to talk about the different kinds of uh, problems that you can have in your back we had title that as an injury section, as well as um, treatment options and how to get better. So let's get to it. Um, this slide shows you some basic anatomy of the spine. And <clears throat> what I think is interesting here is, well, well, first of all, let's get to the spine in and of itself. Basically runs from your skull to your tailbone. It's essentially a stack of bones called vertebra. Um, the orange ones here have ribs attached, and that's how we divided them into the neck uh, vertebra, which we call the cervical vertebra, and the um, thoracic or chest vertebra, um, and then the lumbar vertebra, the low back vertebra. And then we kind of have an extension, which is a solid bone, sort of the keystone in your pelvis that we call the sacrum, which is in there in blue. Interestingly, when you look at the spine from the front, it's pretty straight. And any curves in this plane here um, would be termed scoliosis. That's a description of a curve in this plane. Uh, if you look at the um, Let's see, we're getting some text messages saying we're not seeing the slides. Jean Marie, are you seeing slides? Is it a technical I, issue? 
I am seeing them fine. There may be a little delay sometimes in people's computers with their uh, internet and seeing them. Um, can we just have a raise of hands of anyone who is not, not seeing the slides to see if it's just maybe one person or Oh, she sees them now. So we are all good to go. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just want people to be able to, um, and I am paying attention to, so if there's something uh, very burning question, go ahead and, and send it in there. So um, normally spine is straight when you look at it straight on. From the side, and this is the point, there are curves in the spine and they're very important. Um, they help us keep our head over our pelvis and so this sort of curve in our chest gives us space for our lungs and heart and the curve in the neck getting us going forward helps us be in a position where our head's in front of us so we can see what's going on. And they have specific terms. Lordosis is this curve going back and kyphosis forward, but it's very important that we keep those things in mind as posture isn't just a matter of keeping your spine rigid and straight, but balanced. Um, so, Let's get into a little bit more of the weeds here. When you look closely at this is just being the last few bones at the bottom, you'll see that, so this diagram, this picture here is just the last three vertebra, those bones that we saw earlier, and going down to your tailbone, you'll notice that between the bones, there's a, there's a cushion of cartilage we call the disc or intervertebral disc. And it is what allows us to uh, move around. So the spine works a little bit like a snake. Um, this is a side view. These bones continue on around the back and there's sort of a fin that sticks out, which is used to connect the bones together with a ligament or connection between the bones. You can sometimes feel these bumps in the middle of your back all the way down. And um, this here, so that's the basic structure, a bone, and then a cartilage disc and a bone. Now, you'll notice there's these yellow structures coming here through this. These are the nerves and they're actually running down on the inside of these bones, but the bones are, are kind of a more complicated than it looks here. There's a marshmallow size and shape part in the front, but then they have like a spiky arch. And this here is a top down view, essentially taken as a slice through the disc, which is this light blue part. But you can see how there's these spiky bits, but there's a hole down the middle, which the nerves run down inside of, which are presented by this little um, gray portion of the spinal cord. Okay, very good. So that's, uh, and then one other thing just to kind of get a sense of here, these discs aren't just a homogeneous um, collection of uh, like a jello or something. They're actually a complex structure with a ring of interwoven fibers, a lot like the radial tire fibers you see with a light with a protein on the inside that likes to hold on to water. So essentially you have like a sack with a gel in the middle of it. And that's more of the kind of structure that we're really dealing with when we deal with when you talk about the disc in and of itself. Now we're going to take a closer look at these nerves. You can see the yellow nerves running down inside and then one coming out behind each bone out of a little hole here. Interestingly enough, these nerves are very well mapped out as to what they do. So for instance, when I was teaching anatomy, um, we could follow these nerves in a cadaver down to the muscle that it would go uh, just like a light, uh, a wire in the, in, the, in the house from the light switch to the light itself, we can see where they end and where they spread out and control that muscle to make it move. And they also control sensation. So here, just as an example, um, you'll see here a diagram of uh, a red band as to where this would be the, the first lumbar nerve and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth, um, the pattern. So these are some of the things that we're looking at when we're touching your leg. Does it feel numb here? Do you feel any? funny feeling there, so we can kind of determine what nerve might be involved, if that makes any sense. So this is a little more complicated uh, view. Um, let's stick to some simpler stuff. So here's another side view. This is a cross section to your spine. So here you see a bone and a cartilage and a bone and a cartilage down to your sacrum or tailbone. So the bones are numbered. Uh, 
the 12 in the chest that have ribs or the thoracic. And so we count those as T1, 2, 12. And then we start with the lumbar, the low back and L1 to five. Interestingly, we decided these discs are just gonna be named by the bones they're between. So they don't have their own name. So this would be the lumbar four, five disc or L4, five disc. And we start over again when we get to the sacrum, which is that keystone bone in the pelvis. So that's the numbering system we're using. The spinal cord actually stops down at the bottom of your thoracic spine and sends off individual little nerves. So in your low back, you have these strings of nerves running through here. Um, so that's some of the neurologic anatomy there. Um, and this is just another top-down view showing the disc. So um, here are some of the terms that you might hear uh, with respect to problems. So here's just a cartoon diagram of that low back again, these bones, one through five with their cartilage, right? And the nerves running inside with one coming off behind each bone, like branches off a Christmas tree. So um, something that we hear often is what we call a herniated disc. And that is when one of these discs themselves gives way and starts to push out. Uh, it's a little bit of a complicated uh, occurrence, meaning it's not just a bulge, and we'll see a better diagram of it, but long story short, a herniation implies that part of this cartilage is out of place or pushing out of place. Another term that we come in commonly here is this is bone spurs. Now, bone spurs are generally something that builds up over time. Typically, as this cartilage wears down, it allows the bones to shift and shuck a little, and the body actually starts to calcify bits of the cartilage on the edges, and it forms these spiky bits of bone we call bone spurs. At some point, if things keep progressing, they can actually rub up against nerves and cause problems. Um, another thing is you can get, when we talk about regular old arthritis in your back, often we're talking about these little joints in the back where these bones overlap each other, where there's a slight little patch of cartilage between the two. Um, these little joints called the facet joints can wear down and cause achiness in the back as well. And we'll see more of that here in a minute. So let's talk about a disc herniation. So here's the top down view again. You have those fibers, this thick sac we'll call it. And on the inside of the disc, there's this protein that likes to hold on to water makes essentially a gel, just like you might see if there was uh, something spilled on the floor and you throw a gel on the ground and it soaks up. So these outer fibers have a lot of nerves in them and they can feel when we're moving. It tells us if we're bending, if we're bending too far, that kind of thing, and protects us from doing uh, things that might hurt ourselves. But they can also be hurt when and if this, what we call a nucleus pulposus, which is this gel, tears through these fibers, either from an injury or slow wear and tear and disruption of the fibers themselves as they wear down. And this stuff can cause a lot of back pain as it tears through the fibers of the, we call it annulus, but the sac itself. And then you can see that if this stuff starts to push out where a nerve is passing by, it can actually hurt a nerve, causing that funny feeling that goes down your leg that we call sciatica, a pinched nerve, radiculopathy, all the same thing, um, wherein the leg is not actually the problem, but the nerve that goes down to it is the problem. Somewhat similar to when you like you cross your legs and your leg falls asleep, there's not actually anything wrong physically with your leg, it's the nerve that's going down there that's um, feeling, telling you that something feels funny. So you can have pain in your back from herniated disc and you can have pain down your leg from a herniated disc. That's how this happens. Here's a little more involved cartoon of that. Here's the disc itself with the gel inside. This orange structure is meant to, to show you the nerves that are all over the outside of the disc with their little fibers feeling tension or strain, telling us when we're doing things that are bad. And you can see how if this tears through there, you can have pain what your body feels is in your back, but then also as this gel hurts a nerve that passes by and goes down eventually to your leg, it can make it feel like your leg is on fire or hurting 
are causing pain in the leg as well, even though the problem is coming from your back. So that's how the whole sciatica thing works. There's a couple terminologies. I don't think we'll waste a lot of time with this, but you know, people talk about a bulging disc and that's really kind of a full flat kind of broad part of the disc kind of puckering out. More focal issues like uh, this would be called a protrusion. And when they're actually spitting out by themselves where this space is narrower than this space, we call it an extrusion. Regardless, it can both cause pinching nerves. And sometimes depending on where it's happening, it can change what we end up seeing in your body. Um, just another example here of terminology that's used. We got a herniation, but that herniation, if it's worse, can be called a protrusion where it's actually spitting out or actually broken off, big piece here, what we call sequestration. So those are some more terminology. And here's another diagram, side view. So here's a bone. These are the annulus fibrosis or the sac around the nucleus pulposus or the gel. This is what we want it to look like. The nerves are running up and down in here. Um, and you can see how if the tear is through here, it starts to cause pain and then spits out a rubbing up against nerves. So let's look at a few um, ways to control these symptoms when they happen or get things better. I'm gonna take a step back and talk to you about those little joints that I had briefly mentioned. So when we think of the spine, on the, we, we often are thinking about those discs, but Let's just see if we can, yeah, let, this picture might help. I'm sorry about the watermark and the small size, but this is the neck and we'll just use it as an example for the moment. You can see how, so here's the back of the neck and the front of the neck and you can kind of see it um, spine sort of pasted over that. But you see the slight sliver of cartilage in the bone. Well, the bones continue on around in the back where you have these spiky bits that stick out of the back, which you can feel at the base of your neck but they overlap each other just a little bit right here in the back as well. So they're not connected only in the front, but also behind the nerves in the back on either side where these guys are on either side. We call this, these the facet joints, those little joints in the back of your neck and the back of your back. And they can cause pain in your neck or back. Um, depending on where, how high it is, it can feel like it might be behind your ear if it's coming from the joints up here. If it's coming from the joints down here, it might come down in towards your shoulder. So sometimes, and this is just use of the neck as an example, but sometimes you'll feel pain in your neck or your back in various places, depending on if it is in fact these discs that are wearing down and causing the pain. Um, so one of the things we can do about this pain coming from these joints is get directly at, so this is a, not easy to, to uh, interpret, but this is a picture of the back of the low back spine. And here's where the bones overlap each other and slide up and down on each other where there's the joint we call the facet joint. And there's another one, the one on the other side. And in any case, these joints could have arthritis in them or they could be injured or they could be inflamed. We can, just like if you hurt your knee, um, put a cortisone injection in this little joint. It's typically helpful for injuries, not very helpful for chronic problems. If you have chronic pain coming from these joints, we can actually block the little nerves that go into the joint such that you don't feel as much pain with a procedure that we call it radio frequency ablation. But essentially what we do is we take that tiny little branch of the nerve that goes into this joint and we put a needle down on it that warms up and blunts it. So it doesn't actually cut it or burn it or completely destroy it, but rather makes it less sensitive such that you have less pain. And it's a typically a long lasting effect. So it's not just like a cortisone shot that can wear off if you have a chronic problem. Um, so if you have an acute injury, sometimes we'll put the cortisone in the joint itself, just like you might for your knee if that was injured. If you have a chronic sort of wear and tear kind of back neck issue, we can kind of blunt the pain coming from those nerves. That doesn't preclude this from mechanically wearing down over the years, but you know, if your choices are surgery or suffering, this is a nice option to have 
um, sometimes. So that's one way of treating things. Occasionally we do have to do surgery. Um, this is again, unfortunately, a little bit of a difficult slide to interpret, but what we're looking at is a top down view of essentially the spine. So this might kind of ring a bell for you. You see this sort of outline of that ring or sac of the disc and the muscles around it. So this is a whole body sort of sliced in like, a, like a salami. And you can see how the disc is sort of puckering out here. We can do a surgery that involves a tube. So you make a small cut and then you put a little tiny tube in then a larger tube over that and you take the smaller tube out and you use a microscope to look down that tube and you get a little grabber and you just pull this chunk of stuff off of the nerve and that can help relieve the pain in the nerve that's shooting down your leg. So this is what we call a discectomy wherein we're taking some of the disc out um, we might call it a minimally invasive technique because it involves a small incision of, of somewhere between one and two and a half centimeters, depending on what's going on. Sometimes that's not enough to solve the problem. Sometimes if the problem is not just a little piece of cartilage in the wrong place, but rather just tightness all the way across, we can remove a little bit of bone off of the back to open up the space for the nerves going through there through a similar approach, putting the tube down and sort of taking some of the bone off. Um, it actually is still reasonably structurally sound, the spine doing that. It's a very common procedure called a laminectomy. So this is a discectomy. We're removing a little piece of cartilage. This is a laminectomy where we actually remove some of the bone to make the whole space more open. More often we use this when you have the whole tunnel here where the nerves drove through snug and we sometimes call it stenosis and the symptoms that manifest from that are sometimes called neurogenic claudication or a heaviness going down the legs when you try to stand and walk this minimally invasive technique where we remove some of the bone off the back to make more room for the nerves it's called a laminectomy and helps that type of problem sometimes when the bones are unsteady or loose or shucking around because of the wear and tear in the disc, we have to actually stabilize the bones, they, uh, lock them together. Um, and that requires a little more involved surgery. It can still be done in a minimally invasive way most much of the time. Um, in this case, you see again the two, but now we're putting screws in the bone above and below where they're shifting around and we connect the screws with little connectors, rods or what have you, and essentially hold the bones still so that the bone, it stops hurting you when the bones chuck and move. So this is a minimally invasive again, um, and typically you call this a fusion anytime bones are um, meant to knit together, which most of orthopedic surgery involves, um, these guys are locking together. A fusion, word tends to carry connotations of unpleasant thoughts. It's kind of a ramification of the history of um, the sort of more invasive surgeries where we're doing a larger exposure, taking all the muscle off of the bone and rods and such going up and down. But um, technically when you need to have these bones knit together so they stop moving, that's unfortunately what we have to do. It's a, it's a reasonable treatment for the specific problems and uh, highly effective when it's needed if nothing else has solved the problem. So these are a few, um, you know, options for treating various uh, types of problems. Um, I'm going to show you now um, a couple of pictures of actual um, MRIs, x-rays, etc. to give you a sense of how we put this all together with the anatomy and our examination and how we how we solve problems. Um, this right here, interestingly enough, is all the same picture. Now we're looking at the neck here, so we'll just bear with me. We'll use this as an exam as a as an example, but let's go somewhere easy first. This is a CAT scan. So what we're looking at here is when you go to get a CAT scan, you're essentially getting a three-dimensional x-ray. So we kind of understand what an x-ray is, right? It's a wave, 
of energy that goes through the body and it kind of gets stopped by dense things like teeth and bones and metal. Um, so, and they reverse it typically. So this is the back of the skull. This is the sinuses up here. This is your throat, this is the front of your neck. This is the back of your neck. So it's a side view. And this is the spine. You can kind of make out that pattern of a bone, a sliver of cartilage and a bone, a sliver of cartilage with a bone spur. But obviously this guy's pitched over. There was an accident. The spine is spit over in the front here. And this is torn through here. And the spinal cord is running down through here. So this is what you see when you see a CAT scan. Now, this is the exact same picture, but with an MRI. So with an MRI, which is a magnet, it shows us not really bone so much as other tissues, primarily focused on water or other molecules that can have a polarity to them such that the magnet can affect those and move them and manipulate them such that they can record the energy given off by those movements. So it's a little complicated, but long story short, you can see the spinal cord here, this big gray nerve coming out of the skull and part of the brain. And you can see how it's very tight there, not good, right? Where he's pitched over. It's, it's interestingly a little hard to see the bones. There are these gray squares and here's the discs a little easier to see compared to, for instance, where the bones are obvious. There's a bone and a space in the next bone. Um, they become a little bit less emphasized. We're now looking at the spinal cord with the space around it. So here you see a lot of space in the spinal cord. Here you see no space. On the CAT scan, you'd really not have a good sense of what is really going on there with the nerves. So that's the different kind of pictures. Here's a picture of their low back. So let's take a look at this. This is the same picture that we're gonna see in a minute. A uh, CAT scan right here, bone, cartilage disc, bone, a little bit of an injury with some cartilage smashing into the bone and some pitching forward like we saw a little wide space to this is a cat scan and this here is an mri so this is the bone again and a disc and a bone and this is that ugly looking space that was a disc on the cat scan and the bone here has some cracks in it these light colors and it's torn between the bones connecting and the ligaments and bones connected in the back so these are the different kinds of information that you get from the different pictures. That's why sometimes we're getting MRIs and X-rays or CAT scans because of the different types of information we can glean from them and helping us decide what we can do to help you. Um, and here's a side-by-side -side view of an MRI, a CAT scan, and an X-ray. Now this X-ray is a X-ray done after surgery, which I'll explain in a second, but you can see the exact same pieces of information, but a different coloring. So here you see all the brain and the spinal cord on your MRI. Up in the CAT scan, it's just a big empty space. Here you see these discs and the bones a little bit out of alignment. But in the CAT scan, you'll notice that this disc, as an example, is not just cartilage, but there's some calcification in it, what we call a bone spur. So sometimes that helps us in making plans as to what we have to deal with when trying to solve these problems. This is an X-ray, so more of out of interest, but you can see here the back of the skull right here is this same portion right here. You can vaguely make out the bones. Now these little white parts are part of the surgery performed wherein the disc was taken out and it was replaced by a, essentially a, a polymer or plastic strut, which you don't see, but there are little markers in it to give you a sense of how that locks into the bones. So that's um, kind of an example of all of them together. Um, let's see, where are we here? Uh, and then I have one last thing I'm gonna show you. And again, this is just as an example here. Um, we have an MRI, you'll notice, so this is the tongue in the back of the throat. This is the front of the neck. This is the sternum or top of the chest bone. Um, this is probably a female because there's no Adam's apple sticking out here, which is common. The back of the neck, spinal cord. This disc is not in the best of shape. A little bit of bulging here and in a regular shape to it. Um, this is a type of surgery that we can perform for this kind of 
um, problem wherein we take the disc out and replace it essentially. So if there's a damaged cartilage pushing on the nerves, we take that away and replace it with a strut between the bones and a little metal plate to hold it still. And this is what the x-ray would look like after something like that. Chin, teeth, back of the skull, bone, disc, bone, plate, strut between the bones. And so this is a common type of surgery on the neck followed an anterior cervical discectomy fusion. Um, sometimes, and this will be stabilized and fused. Sometimes if there's the right conditions, we can put a support between the bones that stays mobile called a disc replacement. Um, there's pluses and minuses to these things, but you can see with the neck bending forward and back, that space opens up. Uh, so that's what a disc replacement is. So there's a lot out there, um, a lot, more and more when it comes down to it, if you need surgery can be done with a minimally invasive um, approach. So small incisions, um, of course, surgery is the last option that you do nothing else work. There's a lot of other things um, to do to try and get you moving. Um, we've helped out a whole ton of stuff, including therapy and medicines, et cetera. But just to get through this stuff, um, this is what, what we're thinking when we're doing surgery. These are some of the things that we uh, can do to help you in the thought process. So um, I hope this was helpful. Um, I was, I'm really excited to have had your attention and give you a chance to look at some of these things. Um, I'm happy to take a few um, questions if you have any um, for a little bit. It's uh, 12.34, so we'll get you 10 or 15 minutes of that if you want. Um, and maybe Jean Marie, you can, um, moderate that if there's anything concerning going on. But um, again, this is my crew. Um, we're here in Clearwater primarily, and I'm happy to see if, if any of you need any further help. I have an office and take most insurances. And so I'm going to just give a minute for a couple questions I'm going to come across, and then we'll see if I can answer some of them. Thank you so much. Give me just a second. I am going to stop the recording for the question time.